<clears throat> All right, well, as I've said, we're going to be looking at the next portion of uh, Luke's gospel. This is about the, uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, where our Lord Jesus goes up on a mountain to pray, and he is transfigured before his disciples. And uh, we, what we want to see is what does all this mean, okay? What is this all about? And uh, there's different ways we can approach it, but uh, certainly we want to see in this the glory of our Lord Jesus, why, of course, this makes him attractive, but also this as the reason why we should listen uh, to him. So let me go ahead and read verses 28 through 36, and then we'll, uh, we'll look at, at what it says. So this is what Luke writes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Some eight days after these sayings, he took along Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him and they were Moses and Elijah, who appearing in glory were speaking of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And he, as these were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. While he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. Well, may the Lord bless uh, this part of his word to our um, understanding this morning, to our, our growth in, in grace. Now, again, last week we saw our Lord Jesus questioning his disciples. Who do you say that I am? Peter was the first one to answer, but remember Peter's answer was not his alone. We believe that the others all also likely knew who Jesus was. He answered, you are the Christ of God. You are the Messiah, you are the anointed one, the one the Father has anointed and sent into the world in order to save us. Now again, they didn't fully understand what, what that meant, what that salvation was, but they knew that he was the Christ. Now because he was the Christ, Jesus next told them what was going to happen to him, something that didn't register with them necessarily. Remember, they thought he was a political Messiah, but he really was a spiritual Messiah. So he told them he would be betrayed. He would suffer, he would die, but then he would rise again. And of course, Peter, in his thinking, uh, Jesus being a political Messiah, misunderstanding this mission of Jesus, uh, objected to this. And when he objected, Jesus told him, of course, first of all, get behind me, Satan, this is not God's will, this is Satan's will, self-interest, self-preservation. But then Jesus went on to say this, I'm going to die, but you must also be willing to do exactly the same thing. You must pick up your cross, just like I have. Die to yourselves, die to your goals, die to your aspirations, set aside what you want in life, maybe even what you want out of me in this whole plan, and you need to follow me. Follow me in my example, Jesus says, okay, which means in this case, they have to see themselves as having been crucified with Jesus and having been raised again to life now to live only for his glory. Being a Christian doesn't mean, again, just adding Jesus to your life to kind of enhance what you want to do, but it means surrendering to him, right? Doing what he wants you to do, living the life he wants you to live. And, and by the way, that, that's the better life. It's much better than anything that we might have planned in life, and the end is certainly much better. So this is what Jesus told his disciples, and of course, if we belong to Jesus, if we are his disciples, we have to do the same. Now, Luke goes on to tell us what happened eight days later. And uh, the, the time frame is kind of interesting because the gospel writers don't often use time frames in the scripture. They might say, and immediately Jesus did this, and immediately he did that, or maybe a few days later he did this. But 
here we have some, a specific time frame uh, between uh, events. Um, and as I said, they usually don't mention those things unless they're important for some reason. And the problem is, you know, most commentators sort of pass over it and maybe deal with why it, it, it may not necessarily agree with some of the other gospel writers because the other gospel writers may say six. But again, how you count can be different, including both the beginning and ending days as well as the days that are in between or just the days that are in between. But the question is, why even mention the time frame? Well, one possibility, and I'm not saying that this is the case, but one attractive possibility is that when Jesus was speaking to his disciples about who he was, you know, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? It could very well have been on the Sabbath, you know, on the Old Testament Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. And now eight days later would put us beyond the Sabbath, the next Sabbath, but on the first day of the week, which is eventually going to become the New Testament Sabbath, or what we call the Lord's Day, the day that Jesus would rise from the dead, the day that his, his humiliation would end, and when he would, his glorification would, would begin. And I think that that's kind of an attractive option because what we see taking place eight days later is the glorification of our Lord Jesus Christ, something of that glory that he would receive. Now, whether that was the reason or not, this is now what the disciples see and what Jesus receives. And it's also the reason why we should listen to him because of his glory. Now, this morning, I want us to consider four things from this passage. First of all, Jesus' prayer to receive or to achieve or to obtain this glory. Secondly, the Father's preview of his glory. Thirdly, the reason Jesus receives this glory. And then fourthly, why this glory means we should listen to him. Now, first of all, we see Jesus' prayer to achieve or obtain glory. After eight days, Jesus went up to the mountain to pray, as we've already noted. Now, by the way, we noted also recently just how important it is to pray and how important it was to Jesus. If it's important to Jesus, it needs to be important to us as well. Remember, because the Lord calls us to follow his example. Why was Jesus praying? Well, he was praying because, first of all, this is the way he spent time with his Father. This is the way he communed with him, how he had his relationship with him. This is how our Lord Jesus remembered at least something of what it was like to be in heaven with him before the world began. Because remember, Jesus is a man, you know, he came into the world, he's fully man, he's limited in his knowledge, but he, he is aware. Remember in his high priestly prayer, he prays, you know, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the world. He remembered what it was like to be with his Father. Now we understand that Jesus, as God, the Son of God, he was still in heaven with the Father. The Son is still everywhere at once, right? But as man, he was only in one place at one time, and he was aware of perhaps his continuing presence with the Father in heaven, but certainly with what he had experienced with him in heaven before his descent, as it were, through the incarnation into this world to become one with us. So prayer was a way that Jesus communed with his Father. But prayer was also how Jesus received strength from the Father to do what it is the Father sent him into the world to do. And by the way, what he sent him to do was to, to bring salvation, right? And to make a way for the Father to show mercy by providing the payment for us. But this is ultimately why Jesus would be glorified, right? So prayer was the way he gained strength to do this work. This was, you might call, the secret of his spiritual zeal or resolve, which would ultimately bring him back to heaven in his humanity and for which he would receive glory. So we might say that this is prayer, like all of his other prayers as well, to obtain the glory that was set before him. Remember, he ran the race, he endured the cross, okay? Now, this is also why we need to pray, why we need to spend time with the Father and with the Son, with Jesus, that we might grow more in love with him, 
that we might gain more of the Spirit's influence and power in our lives. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's what gives us zeal to do what the Lord has called us to do so that we might do more for His glory in this world and so in the end, receive more glory, okay? The more we do in this world for, for the Lord, the more we're going to be rewarded on that day, the more glory we're going to have. We're going to see this evening a passage of Scripture that indicates we'll even shine more brightly, which is kind of an interesting thing. Now, Luke tells us on this occasion that Jesus took with him only three of his disciples, the same three he would take with him when he would go to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray before his suffering and death on the cross. Um, we know from Scripture that Jesus loves all that the Father has given to him. And he even basically tells his disciples that of those the Father has given to them, he has loved all of them to the end. Okay? But that doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't have his favorites. You notice he, he, he takes aside these three often to be in, with him in private. He took them to, with the raising of Jairus' daughter. He's taking them up to the Mount of Transfiguration. He will take them in the garden and set them aside from the rest of the disciples to go and pray with him. He has his favorites. Now the question is, why were these three men his favorites? Uh, James and John, you know, the sons of thunder. And, and Peter, the guy who often stuck his foot in his mouth. You know, what, why these three? Well, again, we don't want to be harsh on these men. These men were probably, well, we, we know that Jesus actually knew them from childhood. We know that, as a matter of fact, James and John might have been his cousins, humanly speaking, and they were certainly closely associated with Peter and Andrew, so there was that familiarity. But it could also be that by his grace, these three particular men had become more like Jesus and were more in a line with his will and his plan. Uh, the, the point is that, that Jesus certainly loves us if we belong to him. But Jesus does have his favorites, right? There are those that receive more glory and more honor in heaven than others. And if we want to be among those who are favored, we do need to strive to become more like him. And we can summarize that in this way. As Jesus said on one occasion, the one who humbles himself to become the servant of all, he is the one who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And that's why he's the greatest and if we follow his example, then we will also be great in the kingdom of heaven. So humility and servanthood. Now, again, this was Jesus' prayer to obtain that glory. Secondly, we see the Father give Jesus, or excuse me, uh, give a preview, perhaps to Jesus, but certainly to his disciples, of that glory that he was going to receive in heaven. While he was praying, Jesus was transfigured. He took on a more beautiful kind of elevated look. Luke writes this in verse 29. The appearance of his face became different and his clothing became white and gleaming. Now, I want you to notice that the way Jesus appears on the mountain is the way that Jesus will appear further on in Scripture after his death, after his resurrection, after his ascension, and after his glorification. Remember how he appears to Paul on the road to Damascus. This is what Paul says in his testimony to King Agrippa in Acts 26, verses 13 through 15. He says, at midday, okay, first of all, when the sun would be at its brightest, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Where did this bright light come from? Well, it came from Jesus, the one who was speaking with him. And then consider how John describes Jesus when he appears to him in the book of Revelation to mm, reveal what it is that was going to take place in the near future. In chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, John describes him. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. 
In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in, his, in its strength. So glory, okay, this is what we're seeing here is glory. This brightness, this light is the glory of the Lord. This is the glory of his divinity, of his godhood. Remember what uh, Jesus prayed? I made reference to it already in John 17, verse 5. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Okay? Uh, by the way, you can't say this and believe that God is one person. Okay? I'm just saying that because some of us here are aware that there are people who believe that God is just one person, Unitarians, right? Glorify me, Father, the Son speaking to the Father, with the glory that I had with you before the world was. Now, the point that I want to make here is what, what kind of glory could the Son have with the Father before the world was? It had to be divine glory. But this is also the glory that Jesus would receive in his uh, humanity for the work that he was doing of bringing many sons and daughters to heaven. Now here, Peter, James, and John get a private preview of his glory. This effulgence, this brightness, this glory is essentially a visible representation of his divine character, of his holiness, of his love for what is good and what is right. Uh, some theologians, again, Jonathan Edwards, one of my favorites, says this, that essentially what he showed them was that part of Jesus, that thing about Jesus, that makes him attractive to the believer. This is what the Spirit of God gives us a very small glimpse of when he comes into our souls and raises us spiritually and gives us spiritual life. He shows us the beauty of and the glory of Jesus. And that's why we love Him. And that's why we trust Him. And we trust ourselves completely to Him to save us, whereas before we didn't love Him, we only hated Him and we resisted Him. The difference is now we see Him as beautiful, whereas before we didn't. So this glory is an expression, this light is an expression of that beauty of His glory, of His holiness, of His divine character, and again, His, his human character, which is an expression of the divine character, isn't it? But it's also, I believe, an expression of his majesty. You know, majesty is importance, his greatness, his royal power, his, his authority. That's what majesty is. Now, why do I say that? Because of what Peter writes in 2 Peter 1, verses 16 through 18. He's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. Listen to what he says. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from the Father, or from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased." And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. He's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. So basically, he says, we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. Majesty, again, is royal power, authority, his importance, his greatness. Now, that's important. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. So the, the second point is, again, the Father reveals his glory. Thirdly, the Father reveals why Jesus is going to receive glory, at least in his humanity. Luke tells us that after Jesus was transfigured, there were two men who were speaking with him, Moses and Elijah. Moses, remember, is the mediator of the Old Covenant, the human author of the Pentateuch, which the Jews called the law, right, the law of God. So Moses was the lawgiver. He was the representative of the law. Uh, Elijah was one of the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, one who ministered to the northern kingdom of Israel. And of course, they never actually walked with the Lord up there. They had evil kings and they were committing idolatry continuously while well, Elijah was sent there to declare God's will to them. Now, we've already seen that Elijah is involved in Jesus' ministry in various ways. His involvement was predicted 
by Malachi the prophet. And we also saw something of how it was fulfilled. Jesus said John the Baptist was Elijah, the Elijah that Malachi was talking about who was to come because he spoke with the Spirit and in the power of Elijah. But I want you to notice now we see Elijah appearing with Moses on the mount speaking to Jesus about his coming departure. Not that he was going to catch a plane, but he was going to go to Jerusalem and he was going to leave. You know, he was, he was departing. Where was he departing to? Well, his soul to heaven, his body into Sheol or the grave, right? He was talking about his coming up crucifixion. Now, why these two men? Well, it seems that the Father was showing the disciples and showing us that through Jesus' departure, which was coming, as well as the perfect life which he had lived up to this point, that he will have fulfilled everything that was written in the law and in the prophets. In other words, he would have fulfilled the entire Old Testament. Everything that needed to be done both to save us and to give us the power of the Holy Spirit to obey him, to die to ourselves and to follow him. Remember, that's the blessing of the new covenant. That's what the Lord meant by the promise in Jeremiah 31. And where the author to the Hebrews in Hebrews 8 basically quotes the same thing, that I will take my laws and I'll put them in your minds and I will write them on your hearts and I will be your God and you will be my people. Which means Jesus' work is going to give us a relationship with the Lord that allows us to walk or to live in a way that is pleasing to Him. So Jesus will have completed this work. He will have fulfilled everything that was necessary to do in order to pay for our guilt and to free us from the power of sin so we can walk in His ways. And He also will have done everything that was necessary to do to receive the glory that His Father had promised to give Him. So again, these two men appear because Jesus is basically representing the fact that Jesus is fulfilling everything that these represent everything they wrote about and that's exactly what he did okay now finally his glory this this glory we see on the mountain this revelation of holiness and his majesty is the reason why we should listen to him and obey him now luke tells us that as jesus was praying that peter and his companions had fallen asleep <laughs> again this seems to be a problem with, with these three, struggling to stay awake during prayer. But of course, we, we never have that problem, do we? We never struggle with that because we're always awake, we're always paying attention. So we understand they were human beings. They didn't have quite the endurance that Jesus had, although I think we'd hope to see a little bit more in them, and I think we'd hope to see a little bit more in ourselves as well, especially when you're with Jesus. But Jesus' conversation with Moses and Elijah appears to have awakened them and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory. And they saw the two men standing with him in glory. You know, I want you to realize, too, that Moses and Elijah, they both also had glory. I'm sure it wasn't as much as Jesus had. It just shows that there is glory for following Jesus. Well, then Luke writes this in, in verse 33. After they woke up and they saw this, then apparently at that point they began to leave. And as these were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. It appears as though they were leaving, but Peter wanted them to stay, <laughs> okay? Let's, make, let's set up a tent. You can each have your own tent, and maybe we can just stay here for a while. But while he was saying this, a cloud formed and covered them. This cloud, you know, was probably the glory cloud, probably the Shekinah. Another way, the Father was revealing the glory of his Son. But whatever it was, it made them afraid. And, they, and now the Father had their attention. And now that he did, he said this to them. This is my Son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Now he said this, I think, because of who Jesus is. This is my Son. Okay, listen to him. This is my chosen one. This is my Messiah, the one I sent into the world to be the Lord of creation. Listen to him. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior, your Savior. Listen to him. He's also your Lord. Listen to him. 
Now, he said this because I think of the glory and the majesty that he had just shown them of his son on the mount. This is the one he is setting aside. This is the one he has chosen. This is the one who is king. You need to listen to him. But I can't help but think that he may have also said this because of what Peter just said, <laughs> okay? Peter was looking at the situation, and he saw the two men leaving, and he thought, wait a minute, let's try to do something to keep them all together so we can spend some time with them. Maybe we can build these three tabernacles or tents. The word that's used here is basically those, those little lean-tos that they build during the, the Feast of Booths. You know, it doesn't have to be elaborate. It could just be something to kind of hang out in during that time. And he wanted to build one for each of these men. It's possible that the Feast of Booths was near and that um, Peter was suggesting they celebrate it on the mountain. Or maybe he just wanted them to just stay because, I mean, who wouldn't want to spend time with these three? I mean, they're already with Jesus, certainly with Jesus, but Moses and Elijah as well. So this is Peter's bright idea. But obviously, that's not what the father wanted. He didn't want them to do what they thought was a good idea to do or what they thought might be honoring to Jesus and to these, these two patriarchs, essentially, who were, who were there. Instead, he said, I want you to listen to what Jesus has to say because he's going to tell you what you should be doing. And I think there's a, a point here for us, isn't there? And, and I think the point is this, that we can be very well-meaning as well in the things that we want to do for the Lord. I mean, think of what the church has done for the Lord throughout the centuries. Think about all those humongous churches. We've been watching some videos about, you know, what's like in Germany and, and in England, and they have these huge churches, huge ornate structures. Think about all of these that have been built for the glory and honor of our Lord Jesus Christ throughout the centuries. But we have to ask ourselves this question, is that really what he wanted? Is that what he wants? If it isn't what he wants, then it's really not going to accomplish anything, and it may actually get in the way. And I think perhaps, well, I know that many of the things that, that the people of God have wanted to do for the Lord outside of his will through the years have gotten in the way, gotten in the way of the progress of the gospel. Uh, we may have our ideas of how we would like to serve the Lord and things we'd like to do for Him, but Jesus is the Lord, and He's the Lord of glory. And the Father says we need to listen to Him. So we should do what He tells us to do, and not necessarily what we think is good, unless it agrees, of course, with the Word of God, then it's, that's what He's telling us to do. So listen to Jesus. I mean, if we just simply focused on what Jesus told us to do, I think we would find it would give us plenty. We don't need to find additional things to do. There's plenty that hasn't yet been done. Now, after the Father said this, the cloud was lifted, and apparently the, the two men were lifted with it, and Jesus was left alone. And I think this, again, is to remind us that everything about, that was written in the law and the prophets was all about Jesus. Everything is really about him. After he fulfilled all righteousness, the righteousness of the law, and fulfilled all the prophecies and the prophets uh, by, again, laying down his life, the Old Testament system came to an end. Now, we need to listen to Jesus, and we need to follow him. Now, the last thing that Luke notes is, is this, that the disciples didn't tell anyone about this, and that's likely because Jesus told them not to tell anyone about this. We saw already when he revealed that he was the Messiah, the Christ. He says, don't tell anyone about this. And the reason why he said that was so that he might be able to finish his work, right? Because if too many of his enemies found out who he really was, they would try to kill him before it was his time to lay down his life. So some of these things were hidden. Jesus said, don't tell anyone about what happened. And so they didn't. But we do need to realize the same thing isn't true today, right? Jesus wants us to tell other people who he actually is so that they too might come to know him through faith, that they might give up, again, their lives, pick up their crosses, give up their way of doing things and begin to listen to him and begin to follow him. Now, Jesus is the Lord of glory, and since he is, we should listen to him and what he tells us to do. He wants us to tell others. 
That's what we need to be thinking about. How can we get that message out to them? That's really why we're here, is to share the good news of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us to apply the things that we've heard and through it to become more like our Savior.